I have to admit, thank you very much for the nice compliment about being a young specialist. Uh, I, I mean, I feel flattered to be called a specialist, but I feel extremely flattered to be called a young one, because it's been a few years for me uh, in this industry. Uh, hopefully, in a few words, I will be able to talk to you about, or explain to you the ideas behind what sort of technological innovation is taking place right now in the world, what impact it has on um, the, uh, the governance of sports in general, and what ideas you guys, thinking about the business club, what ideas uh, you can take out of it that hopefully will inspire your further careers, further projects, maybe within the organization that you work with, or maybe within the businesses that you decide to establish. So um, we're moving slowly. All right, so first of all, maybe my main question is, you know, why does it matter for, for business? Because after all, we sit here on the Sports Business Club uh, event. I strongly believe that sport is a mirror of the society. So things that are happening in sports, you can also see them in the society, the behavior, how we treat each other, how we communicate with each other, but also um, some sort of, you know, different new technological trends, new innovations, things that we may see for the first time in this sporting environment. Secondly, let's not forget that sport is, was, and certainly will be, in my opinion, um, part of entertainment business. So we may be thinking about sports as a pure uh, Pierre de Coubertin um, vision of the athletic activity, but in fact, it has always been part of entertainment. People were paying for tickets, they were paying to go and watch the athletes, and these athletes, they became famous for what they were achieving on the sporting, sporting um, uh, level. And, and the, uh, that aspect of entertainment will only continue to grow and expand. And uh, whenever you think about sport, it's not just a game, it's all the things happening around that. It's what makes us talk about it from Monday to, from, to Sunday, not just on the match days. And finally, uh, I strongly believe that by understanding those trends, we'll be able to predict both what sort of challenges we may face ahead and what sort of opportunities will also arise accordingly. And again, for people in the, in the business club like yours, what sort of ideas we could get out of that and where we could lead our own work around that. So first of all, what I want to look at is what is that industry 4.0? And when you think about industry 4.0 that has been here for probably a better part of the last two decades, you know, we're already thinking about the growth or emergence of something that probably will be of the fifth industrial revolution. Then, of course, we will have a quick look at the sports governance itself, just to explain to you maybe some of the key concepts behind that. Uh, and as well, who are the stakeholders involved in, in sports? Let's not forget about those that are actually major actors. And finally, hopefully we can take some sort of uh, lessons, examples of, of what is happening and how this relationship between technology and innovation is affecting sports and what's there ahead of us. Um, before all that, I thought it would be a good idea to introduce myself in a few words as well. You've done it already fantastically. So without further ado, I mean, my contact details are here. You can find me across all social media platforms uh, with the same handle, name, surname, Robert Blaschak. Um, I've been involved in sports media, again, for the better part of the last 20 years. Uh, not for the better part, for over actually 20 years when they realized so this, again, <clears throat> this young specialist feels flattering. I work as a journalist, reporter. I've been both in front of the camera and behind that doing different uh, tasks. I also work on different assignments at the sporting events alongside with the uh, sports governance um, uh, actors. I've done some lecturing on the topics of sports business, sports innovation uh, and, and governance, and as well some research. 
Um, I can disclose to you that I've recently also published um, a book chapter also about the, the sports governance and what, what will be ahead. And, and finally, maybe on the, on the sports business side, just to give you some color painting about my understanding of it. Uh, for the last year, seven, eight years, I've been working on that side of the business with the media rights, with the new technologies, with the gaming and the gamification of the fans ex fan experience. And currently I work at Synergy Sports. Nevertheless, I, it's important for me to uh, make this disclaimer at that point that the presentation I'm about to give you in those few words, it's all about my personal experience and my observations, and it does not represent the view of my company that I work for or any other company. And I will not be discussing anything that is not there in the public uh, domain already. So without further ado, because we've done this uh, introduction, maybe a few words about what is the uh, industry 4.0 and uh, maybe to explain to some of you what's the things we could be expect well expecting from that uh, based on the information uh, we currently have so industry 4.0 one of the key characteristics is the automation so all the things we do it's it, it there's less of the manual work humans are in a way outsourced in many ways a lot of things we can do we can do it via uh, we can do it via automation uh, one important aspect that is driving that change is the cognitive computing and um, things such as artificial intelligence and machine learning that helps us to make decisions on our behalf uh, without human intervention those machines, not only they receive the data, but they are able to uh, proceed the data and come with their own conclusions and suggestions. Uh, what is also important in that aspect is that we are learning about the sustainability of what we do in terms of uh, growth and how we manage that. So the economic one, long-term, how to make sure that the long-term goals are aligned with uh, making sure that we still have a planet to live on in the future and the companies that uh, are operating they are making sure that they will be effectively well eventually profit making and that they will be they will continue to grow in the right way so this is the sustainability aspect again quite strong in the sports sector then there's also connectivity another characteristic of in, uh, of the industry 4.0 uh, 4.0 and the innovation behind that. So we already are experiencing the benefits of 5G, but it will not stop there, of course. But this also means that we are almost certainly all the time uh, connected. Also, thanks to the fact that there's more and more mobile devices. It's not just mobile phones anymore, but we are talking as well about uh, different wearable technology all the things that allow us to be on the move and be connected with the internet, connected with the world, not just in our immediate proximity, but as well as far, far away and feel to be part of it. And uh, the kind of like, again, there's more characteristics, but the one that I wanted to highlight is what's linked with the connectivity is that interconnectedness. Um, as we all know, you know, we are now on social networks and we use that as probably one of the most popular ways of communicating. And we also live in a platform based um, economy. So suddenly every person can be trading some skills, products or other services to another person in a much more uh, well, easier and um, frictionless way than it was ever possible in the past. This is this also links me uh, links to the links my thoughts to the Internet of Things, with the fact that everything out there is available for um, for us to view via internet. There are no things that we cannot find over there out there in the internet, and that gives us the opportunity uh, to to create more inclusive experiences. Even the fact, when you think about the fact that we are having this conversation via a digital platform because of obviously the pandemic, it gives us this kind of 
um, opportunity to have a conversation that otherwise may not be feasible, either because of the logistics or perhaps even the costs. And then what is linked to that, of course, is the fact that we have access to more and more data. People call that the big data. Uh, very few people really understand what, what the definition of that really is, simply because the definition is a fluid concept. And to make sure that uh, things can well, be done faster uh, without human intervention, uh, we can be easier uh, connected with, with others. And, um, and then, of course, you know, the decisions that we make, they make, make more commercial sense in terms of growth and considerations for the both economy and the environment. Right, so this is about the, 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 the topic of uh, the aspects of innovation, uh, technological. Now, let's look at the sports. Uh, this is not by far not a academic definition, but I thought that it would be good to put some sort of like a framework of what this sports governance thing is. And I call that a set of rules and laws within which power, influence and authority is exercised to dictate how sport is run. Um, hopefully this kind of like, um, I you know, made the definition is relatively uh, open, but gives you some sort of understanding of what to expect. Uh, you may be asking yourself, okay, so who's in charge of that? Who is uh, exercising the power, influence, authority over sports? So, well, it trickles down. The, the most important is the so-called Olympic and Paralympic uh, movement that is seen as the most important uh, or the, the foundation, the most important cornerstone of, of global sports. Based on that, each sport is governed by the respective international federations that create a network of, of uh, international organizations that are in charge of, of certain sports and take responsibility for that. And then, of course, that trickles down to the national governing bodies. And I would say that, you know, this is a relatively simple model. So just to give you an example, Olympic uh, movement or Paralympic movement, the international, um, I don't know, Ice Hockey Federation, for instance, it's, you know, irresponsible for that on the worldwide level. Uh, and it's responsible for organizing the World Championships and the Olympics. And then at the uh, national domestic level, each country have their own uh, federation for that sport to, to, to run their game and decide what can be done, what cannot be done and be in charge of that. But um, of course, you know, there's a question of how can that be measured? And I'm helping myself here a little bit with the um, annual review done by the Association of Summer uh, Olympic International Federations, so part of the Olympic movement, and they used uh, the criteria of transparency, integrity, um, democracy, development, and control mechanisms as the pillars of how sports governance can be measured. But to be perfectly honest with you, and as someone that has been working, or at least on the business side of sports for the last almost a decade, and in general sports industry with the media and technology angle for the almost 20 years now, I would say that this is far from conclusive because thinking about how the industry is evolving and who really is, you know, pulling the strings, that definition and that scope of um, owners of that space definitely doesn't reflect what I see on day to day basis. Uh, the private sector is almost non present in that conversation. The athletes, they also are. Um, not uh, as involved as they probably should be, so are the fans that I believe their voice is very rarely heard. Now, so I've looked at different aspects of uh, what uh, is changing in, in that space and how the technological in, um, uh, innovation and change is affecting sports on the governance level 
Uh, I've selected eight of those aspects, but I personally believe that that list could be much, much greater than only the selected uh, items I've put together. So let's start with the athletes that I've mentioned previously. There is a wider shift of how the power moves towards athletes. Um, it's not just the fact that they become more popular. And for instance, the anecdote about uh, Ronaldo, Cristiano Ronaldo moving from Real Madrid to Juventus also took with him a number of followers across social media that brings some value to it. Uh, it's not just what recently was reported about the Kevin De Bruyne and his contract negotiations with uh, his club Manchester City based on his individual performance through data and um, uh, different analytics tools that give you the better understanding of the player value on the on the pitch. It's also because those individual uh, athletes, they became something of media hubs. They create their own content, they broadcast that whenever they want, they choose the form, they choose uh, when, how they want to do it, and they decide how they want those things uh, to be pushed out to the wider world. And that, it's, it's a massive leveler. Previously, those athletes either needed their clubs, their uh, the competitions where they were performing to have the platform and they also needed media to be able to talk uh, to press in a way to, to talk to the fans and have their message heard these days that's gone that's gone and they can directly build relationship with the fans another group that is excluded here that I've mentioned previously or maybe not excluded but not as influential as it should be and um, uh, thinking about that of course, it comes the opportunity to monetize their presence in that space. Uh, I'm just mentioning a name like, uh, sorry, name uh, image likeness that is recently, well, recently came to um, uh, effect uh, and is, is, is empowering athletes, as we may have seen recently in uh, American um, college football, with, for instance, athletes changing the names on the back of their shirts into the uh, Instagram uh, handles that helps them to promote their own individual brands. And what comes with that? I'm not even mentioning those athletes at the top, top level, like the LeBron Jameses or uh, Roger Federer's of the world. I'm talking about the actual power to, to other athletes. And that leads me to the fact that more and more content is created. So we are consuming uh, currently more data points, more images, there are more hours of broadcast than that has ever been done. And this is also linked to the fact that we have uh, the automation that we previously mentioned. So we can produce and record more matches, take more photos, collect more data points than ever before and than we were ever interested. This also means that uh, the whole conversation of you know, who owns that, who distributes that, who is in charge of that conversation and who is leading this conversation in different ways is changing in the way that sports governance of the past was not thinking uh, or it was considered to be out of its scope, whereas now it becomes part of the discussion. Uh, and Again, it, it's, it's for good things and for unfortunately, there are some unfortunate consequence, consequences like the recent conversation about the abuse faced by some athletes, but as well as fellow fans on different social media platforms. So these are the kind of challenges that we definitely need to be addressing. Uh, and this is changing. Uh, when it comes to competitions themselves, technology and the whole innovation that comes with it is affecting the way how we can measure, ensure, uh, and review the, the integrity and fairness of the competitions, as well as the officiating of these matches more than ever before. Uh, using those beautiful acronyms like goal line technology or VAR, uh, we 
are demonstrating different levels of how officiating can be um, influenced by technology and automation. So for instance, in goal line technology, it's an automated uh, camera based system that uh, is able to track whether the ball has crossed the line or um, yeah, whether it's either out of play or goal line towards the goal, etc. There's very little human intervention because it's a yes, no question. In the context of the video assistant referee system, it's a bit more complex because we're using technology to be able to have a second look, third look, or fifth look, or seventh look at different instances. But still, we are using the human intervention to interpret that. And this is still causing uh, something of um, a controversy in many uh, corners. Not to mention the fact that we are thinking already about using technology and automation, for instance, for the um, uh, offside. I'm talking about football, soccer or football, depending on where you are listening to this. Um, but uh, ironically, in other sports, they have been more uh, open about this technological change, or maybe those changes arrived at the time but there was not that much platform to complain about it and raise their, um, well, some sort of um, different considerations, whether people were not fans of that. We didn't have uh, those social media platforms and those sports were almost allowed this little leverage to, to work on their technology as it was improving and get to the position that we currently have in sports like volleyball, hockey, basketball, tennis, where not only they, uh, I wouldn't say perfected, but they have improved significantly, but they also part of the show. And this is quite ent entertaining. And I strongly believe that this will, be, this will also be a great commercial opportunity uh, soon in, in, in soccer, football, like in other sports. Then naturally the technology and the governance should not forget things like biological digital passports about player registrations. So we are now able to track who are the players competing in our competitions, where they were born, when, what maybe even some, some sort of injuries they've come across. When we think about the ongoing pandemic, there's a lot of things that um, the government can probably already uh, take from even the, from the sports world so, you know, having mentioned the doping and having mentioned uh, both on the medical uh, side and how we can look at the previous, um, uh, at the previous, for instance, uh, Olympic Games and how we can review whether uh, some athletes per play it fair or not. Of course, we also have the aspect of the technological doping, which it, that itself could be a topic of a lecture. Just when you think about the so-called uh, shark skin or, or the running uh, shoes, which again, you know, I can probably name some names, but I would prefer to stay away from the advertising of those brands, but you can quickly Google them. It's also because they courted some controversy, but this is a fascinating conversation. If we have access to better equipment, can we use that in our uh, sports? And if we can use that in our sports, how can we stack up those records from the past with the records of the present? Of course, we as humans are built differently now than we were 100 years ago, but also the running shoes have changed. And it doesn't necessarily mean that the athletes competing in 1904 Olympics should be wearing the same shoes that they were uh, they're running in, in 2021. But then again, when is this cut of moment when we decide that 1990s running shoes were good and those records are okay. You know, we could already by then, uh, 20, 30 years ago, already question those records because they were uh, achieved in a different way. So from the governance side, it's a fascinating question. Once this obstacle is overcome, this also opens a lot of commercial and business opportunities to take the, that content uh, far and wide. Um, Oops, just making my move. Right. Accessibility to the roles and the fact that 
sport has been historically considered as quite exclusive uh, club to be based in and to work in. And to get access to it, there were so many different tricks. And you know, you had to know someone or you had to be a former athlete yourself. Uh, I think what is changing with technology in the context of sports is that it gives more people an access to get into uh, the game without necessarily this kind of um, so-called background. So the fact that people are able, for instance, to understand business metrics much better and the value of the participants, either athletes or clubs or teams, the value of the competitions, both to the host nations, to the, uh, com the organizers, as well to the fans. And how do we measure the engagement, all the metrics? Uh, this is making sport more open and inclusive than it has ever been. And I believe that uh, we are much more, uh, as an industry, much more meritocratic now than it has ever been. And I think this is a change for good and it's to a great extent. It's thanks to uh, technology that we have at our disposal. Uh, I have a couple of more, or well, four more uh, aspects, and I, I, I hope that you, you, you find it interesting, relevant, and uh, you can relate that to your professional experiences. The safeguarding and protection of especially young and vulnerable athletes is extremely important. With the technology that we currently have, with the tracking devices, with automated uh, production, with being able to capture more and more control, more and more content uh, than ever before, it's easier for us to um, prevent control and potentially even prosecute or at least give evidence for it uh, in, in, in case of safeguarding and, and, and the athlete's uh, welfare. Um, and it's not just about uh, abuse that you may read about in the front page of the newspapers, but it's, for instance, the way how athletes are trained, how they're coached, whether the, the weights were correctly you know, allocated, whether you know, the players were looked after. I mean, these are kind of you know, important topics that we are still learning uh, about it as we go on. Um, all in all, this also is, is, is connected to the fact that there has been a decentralization and commercialization of talent development process. Previously, those things were almost exclusive for um, either federations, clubs, teams to, to take care of predominantly a young athlete and make her or him uh, much better at certain sports and then progress further and further. What we are seeing now is that there is more of something like a third parties, you know, commercially driven um, organizations that they see value in developing athletes, knowing how much they may be able to earn across different sports, especially the most popular ones uh, for that, uh, almost like incubators. So, you know, these things will be uh, more and more important in the conversation about the sports governance. And I strong, strongly believe that there currently probably aren't the right people sitting at the, the top table to address those things. Uh, I've already mentioned the economic sustainability, thinking about the growth. Uh, you know, how do we understand the growth? How do we understand what is important for, for the rights owners, for the rights holders and different stakeholders? Uh, if I can uh, use this kind of uh, quick bullet list, um, how they measured success. And this is about the things like financing and funding of sport. How do you get the money for sports? How do you justify the money you spend? And how do you um, ma make sure that this, is, that this money is not just burned on the fire like it, has, it might have taken place at some organizations or clubs in the past where it was just spent without much control and much uh, longer vision? Uh, we are able to measure those things much better now than ever before. That also applies to organizing and hosting major events, as well as the fact that more and more sports organizations, clubs, teams, franchises, 
like uh, North uh, American sports executives like to refer them to, they suddenly become very attractive investment propositions for them. And then of course, like I already mentioned, is also the question of the value of sponsorship and advertising. It's no longer just how many minutes a certain logo or brand had exposure in the media, on the TV broadcast. It becomes so much more complex. We need technology to be able to measure that. And by being able to measure that, we can attract more and more sponsors to invest into the game and to develop that. And that's definitely important because that also encourages private sector to be involved in those decision-making processes. Uh, I could not, not mention the emergence of the new sports in general, because whereas we talk about the Olympic and Paralympic uh, movement uh, in charge of sports, there's a lot of sports that I mean, they probably still aspire to be there, and some of them will even be debuting at the Tokyo Olympics later this year. But some of them, they are gaining more and more popularity, but there's a question of who is in charge of them and whether you know, they will be part of this wider uh, Olympic or Paralympic movement, uh, global movement. And if so, you know, would they not want to have a seat at that table as well? So there, I mean, I've selected three types of different new sports that are emerging. One of them I see as the, uh, the urban sports, reflecting the fact that there has been a great urbanization of, uh, of, of, of our uh, world in the last hundred years. So 3x3 FIBA basketball, extremely popular, making its debut in, the, in Tokyo uh, later this year. And same for BMX free style um, competitions that, again, it's, a, it's not something that we thought about as a sport even a few years ago. It's a very urban sport that is extremely popular and there is a way of attracting um, them, uh, the users to um, to the wider Olympic family. But then there's also a question, you know, the, about the equipment that they're using. Talking about the equipment and technology, you have new sports that we will probably categorize as technology led. So the drone racing or uh, different E racing with Formula E or E extreme races powered with the cars powered by electric um, power. You know, this is also led, uh, sorry, led or linked with, sorry, with the environment, which I'm gonna talk about in a second as well. And then finally is the emergence of the digital sports in general. And wow, I mean, where do I start? You know, it's not just the counter strikes and League of Legends, um, etc. but it's also the question of, you know, what is the future of those uh, digital uh, sports? Uh, what is fascinating about them is that these sports allow us to actually participate in different places without necessarily being there. Um, we have seen that already, for instance, in uh, online gambling, you know, when the poker tournaments uh, or even chess tournaments were moved from the physical ones to you being able to participate in, in them from other parts of the world. In the post-pandemic world, I think they will only continue to grow and that will open new questions about integrity, about running them and making sure that they join this uh, wider uh, family of sports. And finally, but you know, last not least, is the environmental sustainability. So uh, first of all, I mean, you probably have seen it yourself, how many people are walking on the streets of all major cities and not only major cities, wearing, um, wearing the athletic leisure, uh, different track suits, uh, yoga pants, and uh, other wear that you would probably associate with sports previously where now suddenly that becomes part of mainstream. Uh, even the casual wear for the, you know, the business at hire, it's perfectly fine to have a jacket for your meeting and then uh, wear uh, popular, elegant uh, trainers that go with it. And this is definitely changing, but this also opens up questions about how much of that is produced. How is it produced? 
and these brands in a sustainable athletically wear uh, space, I believe they're going places and they will be part of a wider, you know, uh, technological change driven by athletes that are the best suited individuals or the best suited actors to promote it via networks to individual users often produced at scale for automation. And of course, when it comes to environment, all these things uh, cannot go without thinking about hosting major events. And the idea of a lot of people traveling from one place to another, um, being involved in uh, uh, both pollution and the wastage in creating different venues and how to make sure that uh, they are part of a solution, not part of the problem. So having you know discussed all of these items, we see those challenges emerging all the time, but for every challenge, I can see more opportunities. And this is the exciting thing um, about where the sport is heading, thanks to uh, technological change. One thing, overarching thing that I did not mention and I did not list, but I think it's probably almost the most important because it's omnipresent, is the leadership is the leadership of on a sports, technology, and business side that will be able to make sure that the all stakeholders are properly empowered and they feel that their voice is heard. And at the end of the day, also the planet is looked after. So these were the few words I wanted to mention to you. And well, uh, guys, uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, I hope you found some inspiration for your future business projects, but also your involvement in the wider uh, sports industry and some ideas of how to make it uh, even better, better for environment, better for us all or inclusive. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Robert. Uh, yeah, but maybe going back to the presentation, I have a pretty important question, I think, for the future. So. Being in mind the changes that, that are coming or actually are uh, within the within the ecosystem, sports ecosystem. So in Europe, essentially, um, would you say that these changes are a pretty important and valuable opportunity to um, eradicate the gap between, for example, Eastern Euro clubs, Western Euro clubs, so remove the inequality or these changes only will, you know, uh, make them uh, worse and bigger, actually. It's a, it's a massive question that you've asked, and it's a fair one. I think the right answer to that is we cannot be thinking about the problems of the future using the framework of the past. So there are a lot of uh, exciting things on the horizon, but it requires you to stop, also like maybe not stop thinking, but about it, but maybe ref reframe the vision that you have about um, about how sport is played within what structure. So again, talking about um, big clubs trying to form their own competition uh, on top of that, because I think you might be alluding to that. Not, not, not only, for example, if we're talking about the technology, let's say technology for tactical development, for scouting, Oh, yes. platforms, for example, so whether these tools will be, I'm not talking about the governance per se, so regulations, but I'm talking about the strict technology in practice, whether these technologies, for example, and these changes can help um, lower rank clubs um, get to the higher point, get to the elite, um, for example, Champions League, or, and that's my hypothesis, it will only make uh, the equality um, bigger. No, I think it's okay. I got you. Um, I definitely believe that, again, just like in accessibility to the roles within the within the sports industry, technology is helping those clubs to uh, get access to some of the best talent and to grow and expand faster and into a better direction. So let me give you one of those, those ideas. A club that you would probably immediately associate with um, uh, big, powerful um, corporate business behind that, such as 
uh, RB uh, Leipzig and the, the whole Red Bull uh, group that's behind that. Yes, you know, they had the financial resources to take the club from the fifth year of German football all the way to the Champions League uh, competitions. But, you know, at the beginning, they were not like buying their way through by signing Ronaldinho's and Messi's into that club, but they were very smart about scouting and they continue to be as a group. So they've realized, for instance, that by uh, using uh, different uh, tactical analytics, sorry, not tactical, uh, scouting analytics uh, tools, they're able to find talents that might have been overlooked by someone else, or they might have been uh, deployed. Uh, previously, you would need to send a human, and now you could actually scout deeper and more competitions at the same time from the comfort of your office to begin with. And for smaller clubs, you know, there's so many different companies that are providing, maybe not so many, but there's there's a number of companies that provide that uh, technology. So it, it allows them to, to find uh, different products. And of course, those products come with different quality. You, the better quality, the more it costs. But to have the foundation on the sports level, it's you have a similar um, entry point on price. And I think that's that's great because that makes it more inclusive for you for the use of technology. Yeah, but that also leads me to the next question. So whether you uh, envision that in the future, in the immediate future, we can actually um, expect uh, the entry of a big brand, big international brand, such as Red Bull, for example, into the football and doing it on the global scale, so not only one one club as a let's say the toy for the owner, but as a as a big component of the big business, such as uh, as I mentioned, Red Bull. Do you see that change coming, or we can expect more like um, you know, for example, Saudi Arabian co companies buying the shares in the clubs, or we will see more like this, you know, um, structured structured complete projects, uh, long-term projects, such as Red Bull, using, for example, technologies also? Well, it's, there's, a, there's a number of answers to that question, because it depends you know, how you look at that. From, and the same person can give you different answers, answers. To give you one example to that is, there's very few clubs that, as a standalone, they're worth acquiring. You're not acquiring a club for the sake of having access to the logo or the brand or the fan base even, but you often acquire the club because of what competitions it participates in. The reason why, for example, North American franchises are increasing their valuation is because of the competitions that they participate in, both in terms of being world's best in basketball, American football, hockey, baseball. You have no doubt that by acquiring a team there, a franchise, you're acquiring one of the best in the in the world and now you know with soccer both with mls and uh, uh, wsnl the women's uh, soccer national league uh, this you know this is also growing in that space what is changing however is that people buy those clubs because of the competitions where they participate also in europe or where they may be in the future so buying uh, some of those clubs you, you, you buy access to a competition or maybe you buy a club that's below that competition hoping that you're going to get there and you will get access to the revenues that it brings but, and, but yeah but the question so sorry to interrupt you but the question was more about like so for example let's say we have inter milan with the chinese investors we have manchester city psg and so on so this is probably one term uh you know they invest only, for example, in one club, they want the recognition in Europe, maybe some contact and deal like this. Then we, for example, have Red Bull, which is a more like long-term project with more on a science technology based or technology centric. And so, so the question is whether we will see more like the, these projects or pure investments, for example, from the Chinese money, which is, which is huge right now, and maybe they will enter. But, you know, when these investors uh, come in into, for example, clubs, they just only give money. They don't, you know, uh, as for example, in the case of Valencia, they invest, but they don't care. 
actually. And the club is now, you know, diminishing of its position in, in Europe. It doesn't play Europe, Champions League, Europe League anymore. But then we have this complete project, which is like example to follow. Even though there is a huge money, but there is a complete structure of what you want to achieve, how you want to achieve, and that's good for the for the for the football soccer, right? Mm-hmm. And so yeah, so the question was whether we can you know we can wait and we can expect more like this structure um, project, also because football is not is not a predictable game, as we. As we talked about this before even the event that uh, you told me that this is you know the fact that you buy one two three players even the code doesn't mean that you will win the probability is not so high because the football is more like a long-term game in the leagues in the champions league and you can have all the money but then for example uh, you have clubs that are you know for runners for 20 years and they uh, almost always win and so the question is whether we whether there will be a brand that will decide to to put the capital inside the clubs and build the long term project for twenty years, for example, as Red will do. Does look uh, very so. Maybe a simple answer to a complex question is: it's a question whether you understand buying club as an asset or buying a club as a liability. So for some people buying a club, it may be almost a reputational exercise of trying to become, to have access to a very expensive members club that allows you to have a seat at the table that you always aspire to sit. And you're using a club or sport more broadly to become part of that kind of conversation. And whether that will continue or not, and seeing in that case sport more as a liability, financial liability, it will depend on uh, what are the end goals of the person or the organization that is acquiring that club. For those who are thinking already about clubs as assets, they will be definitely looking at the long-term gain. They will be definitely using technology to, to get those marginal gains you know, because they they will see their their acquisition of a sports club as something that will be both bringing them revenues on annual um, basis, but as well as it will increase its own valuation mm-hmm. and potentially would be an attractive uh, asset to sell later on, just like you would behave with stock exchange. Uh, the difference is that uh, and the exciting thing about sports is that it's less predictive uh, in the way that um, you find the results of the game relatively quickly and you feel you can influence and you feel you can master that. But in fairness, there's a lot of uh, things that you can change. With the technology, it's almost like getting a smarter algorithms that help you with the trading of on the stock exchange. And you know, and, and if you, if you see uh, that as an asset, uh, you know this this is this is great. Big, I have to mention that a big difference here is of course is that most of those sports organizations, if not all of them, they come with a community of fans, and this is one of the biggest challenges that we will be facing. So let me explain you this. If I go to a stock exchange and buy shares in certain business. You know, you don't necessarily think about all the funds of that business. You know, you want that company to do well, but it, it's not that it's, you know, apart from the people already working there, you're not necessarily thinking about the, the impact of that uh, business, especially on the worldwide level, uh, with, uh, with, with the way how it performs uh, financially. Whereas, you know, sports organizations, they have this extremely important element of also the community and the, the aspect behind it. And this is something that I just wanted to reiterate because it's an extremely di- important differentiator, but this is also what makes uh, sport so amazing. You know, this is also why we call football the beautiful game because you know, it comes with the community around it and being able to successfully not only achieve success on the balance sheet, but also in the hearts of the people that keep fingers crossed for the club, it's extremely important. And 
those two things have to go hand in hand. Yeah, and talking about also about the, the, the fund, this is very interesting and important topic for the future. So um, the question connects to the fund engagement, actually. So we see the very, very strong trend, uh, maybe not present in all the countries or, or the clubs, but very strong tr trend toward connected funds. So being, you know, the connection is very strong because it allows you to um, to execute a decision making power, for example, buying power of the fund and so on and so on. And very often these funds are not only local but on the national scale, very very frequently. And but what, what we see at the at the same time is that clubs want to diversify uh, the 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 body of the funds. So for example, going to the China market, US market. And for example, you work in the sports, mm, connected to the sports media, for example, and you see that some good, very important matches in La Liga, let's say in Spain, are played very late Saturday, very late Sunday, so that we allow other countries to catch up with the time zone, let's say. And there were some complaints about this because, you know, fans, local fans, national fans in Spain and Europe said, like we are the those who pay tickets and so on and so on. We are the most connected. And why, you know, why are you doing that? And do you see that it, there is a contradiction and it would be very difficult for clubs to, at the same time, take care of the local sounds, connect them as much as possible, but at the same time, expand to other markets because of the natural obstacles, cultural time zones and so on. How, how clubs can, you know, can do it at the same time. I probably wouldn't say it's a contradiction. I would say that this is both a challenge and opportunity. Um, I myself, I'm, I'm part of the Chelsea Supporters Trust uh, and a non-profit organization that is looking after different um, supporter and fan uh, matters around uh, Chelsea Football Club. And what is interesting in that conversation is the difference between a fan that is keeping fingers crossed for the team from far, far away, but as well as those who go to the stadiums and chip in, contribute, participate in the, in the club's life in person by going to the venues. Now, this is interesting because the pandemic has been a massive leveler. In most of the countries, no one actually goes to the stadiums. No one actually, you know, can follow this, the, the teams in a way that they used to do it. So the reason for, you've mentioned those kick of times to, to, to make it more attractive for more people to watch it is the, the, well, the, the, the challenge behind that is we need to find the way how to make them feel that they're not just fans or viewers of a club or a competition, but also how they actively contribute to that club success. And of course, people say merchandise, sell the shirts. And it's been the most basic one, right? The idea of uh, you know players like David Beckham moving to Real Madrid and immediately uh, exploiting the sales of uh, Real Madrid shirts at the time in Asian markets, even though you know the, the share of revenues that the club may be getting is not necessarily significant, but it was you know driving much wider popularity of the club brand in different territories, which would convert into sponsorship deals. But with what's happening now with technology, we can get much more smarter about it. The whole tokenization, the blockchain of how you get funds involved making them feel engaged through different um, competitions, so, uh, different choices that they make. For instance, about how the stadium looks like, what painting would be or mural would be on some of the walls, what uh, would be the color of the third kit for the team that maybe if it's a football club, maybe they're gonna wear that three times in the year. And it's not that crucial, but for the fans, it gives them a bit of power and convert a fan or viewer from far, far away land into someone who feels that she or he is directly contributing to the, fan, to the club's life 
somewhere else in the world. And technology helps us with that. And staying um, also within the, the range of sports media, because you have experience in that, and that I think is pretty important also question. So we see also the trend of expansion or higher and higher uh, evaluation of the sports uh, rights for particular leagues, for example, in Europe, in football Europe. Um, and we see that also there are less and less competitors because not every company can you know, have money for that. And, but there are some companies who are still not in the race, but they plan to do it and they are very rich, such as Facebook, Amazon, etc. cetera. Um, in three years, do you, do you uh, envision that, because the zone is already present, it's maybe not the, 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 you know, the, at the top, but it's, it's quickly catching up with the competition. In three years, do you see that technological companies, very rich companies uh, will acquire um, sports media rights and beat the competition because of the valuation? Because we can reach the point where, where there will be only one, two companies in Europe where can, can really you know, have this money for that, the monopolies. Well, but then this is also why it's important to invest in different competitions and making sure that different competitions grow. So when one, for instance, become out of pocket for certain broadcasters, there is still an interactive, uh, so interesting proposition for the fans to watch somewhere else. Um, what I was mentioning earlier about the industry 4.0 uh, was this aspect of the social networks and platform-based economy. And these economies, they have access to the, so these economies, these platforms, these networks have access to much bigger data points about the users. And some of them, that's much easier for them also to commercialize that, monetize that. So for instance, you know, if they know that there is an interest if you, for you to, to follow certain teams or you have a pattern of uh, purchasing different products, you may be also more keen to spend money on something else. And this is what I think makes them stronger in uh, understanding the viewers and the value of the viewers, as opposed to the traditional broadcasters. But nevertheless, the traditional broadcasters are not standing still. They're also learning more about the viewers. They're also asking more questions. And they're also, they're also trying to understand the, the pattern of the behavior of those users. So it's, 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 it, it would be easy to assume that, you know, those big uh, technology companies will overtake everything. You know, the big uh, broadcasters, but even the small ones are working really hard to gain their own advantage uh, in, in that battle. Uh, I, I'm, I definitely will see more and more uh, social media platforms. Um, becoming the destinations to watch more and more live sports, but it will not be exclusively there. There will be still uh, space for different type of broadcasters, either the, for the tier one, uh, most uh, elite uh, content, as well as for a bit niche level uh, sports. I myself, during the pandemic, I got into sports, for instance, like surfing. You know, you cannot watch surfing on the big platforms. But if you go to some of the niche content, I love the content that they do. I love it. It's super engaging. But this is for the so-called super fans and people who are looking for that stuff. And like I told you moments ago, um, even the new sports, those new sports, no one knew of them 10 years ago or they were not that popular. And now, you know, you can, for instance, go to uh, a YouTube channel for, for FIBA 3x3 and watch all the competitions uh, over there and follow the sport. So I think there's a lot of cool ways that we can have access to sports and it will not just be through those major platforms. Okay, and the last final question is about the balance of power um, in football. Uh, we saw clashes a few months ago or months ago, even during the international matches, the clashes between clubs, players, and federations and the international body, for example, um, UFO or, or, or FIFA, right? Do you see the diminishing power of these international bodies that regulate many, many, um, many aspects inside the ecosystem and the growing power of, of clubs 
who possess the value actually and the money they attract the money that you have for example um using their then and using the spotlight um how how you see that balance of power because you know the reputation of UEFA for example FIFA is diminishing rather than money laundering uh, Qatar for example World Cup uh, Russia World Cup so this was the the examples for the fans that you know we don't trust as as much these this international organizations as we trust for example clubs players uh, because we are connected to them look first of all I honestly believe and I generally believe that uh, those international organizations they have changed a lot in the way how they do their business and the things that we might have seen 10 15 years ago about the governance it, it definitely has improved and it has changed uh, so of course you know there was a lot of criticism around that in a way one of the biggest well the best ways out of that uh, um, is to is to address another a challenge which is the fact that if if you are both regulating the competition but you're also organizing that competition it and then sell the rights to commercialize it uh, it, it 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 puts you in a vulnerable position and i think you know for those organizations this is something that they should look into in order to protect their position in the future um when it comes to you know the whole landscape change i don't believe that we should be taken hostage of the past and of the history we should of course respect the traditions that we have but it doesn't mean that the way how the competitions were structured 50 years ago it should be structured the same way in 50 years time uh, not to not to mention the fact that the technology the very core topic of our conversation it has changed it's easier for us to travel it's easier for us to interconnect it's easier for us to watch a lot of content from different places at the same time without necessarily leaving our own sofa to follow that and feel, feel engaged so what will change in my opinion is the understanding of how do we consume sports as a fan the way how we can interact with the sport more directly um, and, and, and for those, uh, for those big organizations, you know, they, they can also protect themselves much more by um, relying on those partners to, to, to run those competitions for them and taking almost a step back and focusing on regulating uh, things from the legal, from the regulation, from the laws, etc. perspective. And I think this will be eventually the path for, for sports across different levels. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that, for that um, answers. Yeah, it's also great to believe that, um, that the power that can be within the fans, how they consume the sports, will also actually govern how organizations respond to that and what path they will um, you know, take. Because previously it wasn't the connection because of also of lack of the data. Now we have the the value that people, companies, organizations, federations see the value of data and how we can personalize the content. And for that reason, now the user actually without the awareness sometimes, but is the decision maker by the actions he or she takes. So yeah, I greatly believe that uh, he or she will be the decision maker in the, in the future of sports. Okay, so thank you very much for, for that meeting. That was very great. Uh, we thank you very much. Uh, it was pretty interesting. And the sport governance, I think, is a very undervalued topic. Um, so, you know, we look forward to, to hearing it more in the, in the media, in the mainstream, but also maybe in the future meetings. Look, I'm happy to um, share some ideas with you. And hopefully, you also, uh, you also understand different concepts within um, the sports industry, how it's uh, not just run, but how it's governed. and you know who's in charge of taking that further and you know people at institutions like yours uh, take that inspiration look across different sectors because the world will be even more interconnected in sports industry will be more interconnected with the consumer industries for instance and and with all that knowledge you guys will be also able to 
take it further and to convert those ideas into some cool projects and maybe businesses. Yeah, for sure. I hope so. Okay, so so thank you for today. Thanks a lot and yeah, have a good evening.